Well, good morning or evening or afternoon or whenever it is that you're viewing this online message, which just so happens to be the conclusion of this series, Chasing Happy. You know, every time we've said that title, Chasing Happy, it always makes me think of the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. Pastor James referenced this in the first message of this series, and many of us know that this phrase is part of a larger phrase written in the Declaration of Independence, signed on July 4th, 1776, by all 13 colonies at the time, which paved the way for this country to become the United States of America. It reads as follows. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, if you're like me, you could sit there and unpack so many things from that one sentence that could take you down the path of history and make you think you should do your own history podcast, which by the way, please don't do that. There are plenty of those. This phrase declares several things that are, as it says, supposed to be self-evident. Everyone is created equal. Everyone has the right given by God to life, to freedom, and to pursue that which makes them happy, so long as that pursuit doesn't go against the aforementioned rights. Now, for many of us, we don't need this sentence to know that it's true, or rather to see it in action. For many of us, we think, well, yeah, obviously, I can pursue happiness, whatever makes me happy. That's a given. I mean, God wants me to be happy, right? Well, yeah, kind of. It's not a commandment. God didn't give Moses the tablets with a precursor that said, all of these things are going to make you happy. Now, I'm sure God wants us to be happy. God is described over and over and over and over and over as a good father, the perfect father to all of his children, which is us. We are his kids. Now, if you're a parent, you know there is nothing in the world that beats seeing your kid light up a room with their happiness. Their happiness brings you happiness. When I hear my daughter laugh and her laughter just increases to the point of tears or where she can't breathe, it makes me laugh and it just makes my day. When we experience happiness, God, I believe, experiences that with us. But as a parent, I also know that my kid isn't gonna be happy all the time. There are times where correction is needed. There are times where neither she nor I get to do what we want and it makes us unhappy. There are times where there are tears flowing because that thing that she wanted, that she was pursuing, just wasn't going to happen. And it brought the moment down to the lowest of the lows. The same goes for us as adults. We aren't happy all the time. At least, not in the sense of Everything is wonderful and we want this moment to last for the rest of our lives. And when that hits, that's typically when we remind ourselves that the pursuit isn't over. Happiness is currently out of reach and I have to jump up and pursue or I'm gonna be stuck in this moment forever. The pursuit of happiness isn't necessarily a bad thing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with chasing a dream that can make you happier. For example, if you want to be mad swole and the bigger you get, the happier you are with your body and your progress, then by all means, go for it. If you think a new job, a new career, a new path forward is what's going to make you happy, then do what you can to make that happen and get that happiness. If you aren't satisfied with where you are in your finances, sign up for Financial Peace University and grab that peace and happiness that comes from being debt free and on your way to becoming a millionaire which I would assume would make most people happy. I think, however, that while the pursuit of happiness is a good thing, it can also be a bad thing. See, whether I realize it or not, oftentimes that phrase, the pursuit of happiness, defines my entire being. What I mean is that regardless of what's going on in my life, I'm supposed to pursue happiness. Because we never talk about obtaining happiness. We talk about pursuing happiness. And sometimes we even pursue things that don't make us happy, or we think they're going to make us happy. We pursue that relationship outside of our marriage. And then once we get it, we realize that this isn't what makes us happy. 
Maybe that new job we thought was going to be the answer to all our prayers. We get it and we work for a week and we realize this isn't what I thought it was going to be. See, Kid Cudi produced a song called Pursuit of Happiness. For those of you who are older or maybe don't know, Kid Cudi is a rapper. And in it, he sings. I'm not going to sing for you, but I'll tell you what it says. I'm in the pursuit of happiness and I know everything that shines ain't always going to be gold. I'll be fine once I get it. I'll be good. See, but here's why I love this series that we're in. It's shown us that happiness is something that can be an all the time thing in so many ways. But when I define my being with pursuing happiness and not knowing how to be happy all the time, I'm consistently unsatisfied. I'm consistently not where I want to be. I'm consistently not content. Content. That's the word. Content. See, there's nothing wrong with the pursuit of happiness as long as we know how to be content in our current situation while we pursue that happiness. That thing that will make us happy, which, by the way, is just a moment. We spend our lives pursuing these moments that make us happy only to stop being happy and then pursue the next thing. This endless cycle for that thing that will make us happy for only a moment doesn't actually give birth to true happiness. But being content does. And we can see this lived out in the example of Paul. Now, if you don't know who Paul is, Paul is one of the early Christians who had previously executed Christians. But he was converted to Christianity when he literally ran into Jesus on the way to kill more Christians. After that interaction, Paul began his lifelong ministry of traveling from town to town, province to province, city to city, to tell people about Jesus. In doing so, he wrote many letters to those churches. And that makes up the majority of what we have called the New Testament. But here's one interesting thing about that. Several of these letters were written while Paul was in prison for preaching the gospel or the good news about Jesus. In the Christian community, we call these the prison epistles, which include Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Inside these letters, again, written from prison, are some of the most inspirational, uplifting, and encouraging verses I've come across in Scripture. Here's one that Pastor James mentioned earlier in this series. You can find it in Philippians. It's Philippians 4.8, and it says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. The guy is in prison and he's telling his church, think about what's right, think about what's pure, think about what is lovely. Let me tell you, if I'm in prison, I'm not thinking of anything lovely and I'll just let your imagination run wild with that one. But here's another verse that he writes in Ephesians. Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 6, it says this, As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. From prison, he's telling people to be unified, to realize that the same God who saved you also saved the person sitting next to you. The same God who gave you grace, even though you don't deserve it, gave it to the person in the seats next to you on a non-COVID Sunday, who also doesn't deserve it. From prison, he's preaching the gospel and encouraging others to continue in their faith. He's in prison for doing this very thing, yet he continues to preach from prison. I mean, talk about taking your faith seriously, right? But here's my favorite verse that Paul writes from prison, and it's found again in Philippians, which, by the way, Philippians is a gold mine. So if you've never read it, make sure to read it today. But in Philippians, again, chapter 4, 10 through 13, and then also verse 19. Here's what it says, starting in verse 10. 
I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And then verse 19 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. He says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. We don't have any way of knowing this for sure. But I would imagine that Paul wasn't happy in prison. He had a calling to go and preach the gospel and spread the news about Jesus to people who hadn't heard it before. This was his goal, his passion, his calling directly from Jesus. And it's really hard to do that from prison, especially when there isn't Facebook or Instagram. Being in prison prevented him from doing this. It prevented him from pursuing his calling, prevented him from pursuing that thing that would make him happy. And yet, he was content. He writes that he knows what it's like to be in the ups, the downs, to have and to have not. And as we've established, he knows what it's like to be free and to be in prison. And yet, despite all that, despite the circumstance, despite the situation, despite the quarantine, he feels being imprisoned, he's content. Paul resides in the truth that we, as Christians, might know but don't live out. Paul, according to verse 19, knows that God will meet all our needs. Paul knows that as Christians, we have the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead living inside of us. And if he raised Jesus from the dead, what more can he do in our lives while we are still alive? And if we have the same Holy Spirit living inside of us, if we have this truth that God is all we need and can fulfill our needs, then we can live in contentment. To bring this home a bit, if I go back to the beginning of this whole pandemic, which, by the way, still a thing, if I go back to the beginning, I can't tell you how many people I spoke to that were depressed, mad, sad, frustrated, confused, and downright infuriated that they had to stay home, that they couldn't go to the gym, they couldn't go to work, they no longer had a job, and maybe some of you still don't have a job. They couldn't have the events they planned, graduations, weddings, funerals, and hey, I get it. Those are real feelings, and it's totally okay to feel those things. But where it isn't okay is to sit in it and stew and stay discontent. I think for me, the idea of being content regardless of the circumstance really hit home a little over two years ago. Uh, August of, of 2018, I was sitting at my desk at work and I got a text message from my dad. I'd been dreading this text for a while, but it simply said, your papa passed early this morning. My grandpa had been sick and in and out of the hospital for some time. And unfortunately, I hadn't been as close with them as I wish I had been. So immediately the regrets and the wishes and the sadness started to just overflow uh, inside of me. Fast forward to the viewing and the funeral and I was blown away at how many people were there. Uh, it was like the whole town and the next town over showed up to pay their respects to this man whose name I share. Now granted it was a small town, uh, but still it's amazing to see how many people showed up. My grandpa was one of the most selfless, silliest, caring, helping guys you'd ever meet. I don't think he ever met someone who didn't end up being his friend after talking with him for five minutes. And I was in awe that this man, who didn't have much, he didn't have money, he didn't have cars, a big house, and even at the end he didn't really have his health, but he had what he had in people who showed up to say goodbye. I remember after the funeral sitting at my grandparents' table, 
and my dad was uh, to one side of me and then my grandma was across the table. And I sat there and I told her that I was sorry that I hadn't been there. And I, I hoped that my grandpa knew that I loved him. I'll never forget what she said. She said, oh honey, he knew. You know your grandpa never had much. We didn't have money or things, but we always had our family. And even though he's gone, he still has that. And that always made him happy. My grandpa, I'm sure, wanted more for himself, for his wife, for his family. And I'm sure having his health and having a few more years with his family would have made him happy. And if you'd have asked him if he wanted that, he'd have said, absolutely. But he didn't get it. He passed. But when he left, he was content. See, contrary to popular belief, it is quite possible to not be where you want, not get what you want, and yet be content. I hated the fact, and I still do, that I don't get more time with my grandpa. I want more time with him. If I had it, you better believe that would make me happy. Yet, what I choose to focus on in this moment is the fact that I'm getting more time with my wife and kid that I've had since getting married eight years ago and having a kid three years ago. I'm choosing to focus on the fact that if all things were taken away from me, I'd still have God. It wouldn't be what I want, but I don't have to have everything that I want to be content. I don't have to get lost in the pursuit of happiness. I don't have to chase happy because I can choose to be content whatever the circumstance and live in the truth and faith that God supplies all my needs at all times. And I can know that even if I don't feel like I have enough or if I don't feel enough, God sees me as more than enough and I can reside in His love. So my question to you is, is what God says about you enough? If you never got that thing you're working towards, if your pursuit of happiness ended in the same pursuit, would you be okay with that? Would you be able to find contentment in your circumstance and in so doing be happy in the pursuit? Would you be happy in the mundane, in those tasks that don't seem important, in those things that aren't part of your pursuit? Would you be happy in those moments? See, Pastor James started off this series by telling us that happiness is spelled F-O-C-U-S. I think synonymously, you can also spell it C-O-N-T-E-N-T. -E